can just show the picture of the, the this was the picture of the, um, the Dan Flavin, the Dan Flavin skylight that I was mentioning earlier. Are there any questions? The language used in, in RAP, I think there is something to expand and to integrate here with the rappers and their language and their way, they way to pronounce and to phrase and to, to completely transform language. I think it's fascinating, but I see it, you know, you, we have this, you, you show this uh, excerpt of this uh, singer, but I would, I would like to see more with rappers. I think they are extraordinary with languages and sounds and, and the body language as well. Well, Fra what France do you think about that? Fran well, French had a very, very good rap tradition in the 90s, I remember. Unfortunately, it's been lost. But um, French rap was very good, and especially in the 90s, I was saying. But uh, yeah, I think it's, I'm dreaming of a, of a stand-up comedy sketch as a lecture performance, but not a rap yet. <laughs> I think that would uh, first have to get to uh, through one, then the other. Or maybe they can both be the same. An exhibition in the museum. Oh, sorry, in the Museum of Contemporary Contemporary Art in Chicago, with a group of um, musicians, and and then an installation, different installations, mixing objects and sounds and classical music and rap, and I, I, it makes me think about your work, but more uh, music oriented. But uh, it's. Uh, so it, this work in, does integrate uh, rap and other things and also kicking objects. Uh, fabulous, fabulous installation, extremely complex and rich. I, I mean, I'm not suitable to talk about it. I'm just you know, expressing mm -hmm. myself. It's a reaction to your talk because I'm, it's, it's, it's not what I do, but it, I, I really, um, it's extremely uh, stimulating, very interesting work that you are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, for this uh, great talk. Actually, I'm wondering, maybe, could you say a little bit more about the uh, possible place of uh, gender in this, uh, in your project or in project of the collective? Because, I mean, up there, you can see mother tongue and father throats. And at the same time, at what point in your presentation, I saw the word transvestism, and it, uh, well, I misrecognized as transvestism. I'm like, how does that relate to the talk? But now, come back, coming back to it, I'm just thinking whether, because you know that sometimes when, when a certain language got a new script and it got rid of certain letters, and the sound, sometimes people think it you know, sounds too savage or too feminine or sometimes too masculine. So at the same time, when you transform a language through a certain script, maybe there is a concern about gender, about making the language or remaking it in a certain direction <coughs> in order to have a certain kind of reformed relation with gender, with you know, gender self-positioning? Um, it's a very good question. And it actually goes to the core of the, something that we discussed with a name. So this, this, this perf lecture performance has been, we've, we've been asked several times to change the title from tranny tees to transliterative tees uh, out of concern of offending uh, the transgender community, which it's not intended to. Actually, it's using the word tranny as kind of reclaiming the word for its progressive act potential as opposed to a, a kind of pejorative sense. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's actually, I mean, there's a lot of essentializing uh, what I've read about like the oral being the domain of the women, for example, especially in Islam, um, and the scripted being, or kind of the printed word being the, the do domain of men, just because of course the power dynamics that were early on when books were first printed and, and, uh, and how um, power became more horizontal with the arrival of the printed word. Um, I would be interested in, in, in actually reading more. Um, gender in general is something that we've, uh, we've not direct de dealt with sort of uh, frontally. I mean, there's gender involved in the works. I mean, as soon as you deal with sexuality, I think that you have to deal with gender, but not in fixed ways. And I think, and I hope that it, the, that the kind of performative aspect of the language um, speaks to that kind of fluid, fluid question of identity as well. Um, even the idea of identities, 
even in the very name Slavs and Tatars, is, is a kind of accumulation of identities and collapsing those identity politics that normally you're subjected to. Uh, I mean, as an artist, are you a Pakistani British artist or are you a Canadian Chinese artist? I find these kind of terms highly reductive and almost, um, almost out of date with the world we live in, in the same way that we talk about left and right politics. And it doesn't really fit anymore when you have people like Donald Trump politics being quite sometimes quite populist and leftist as opposed to kind of you know they, we live in a, in, a, in a very different time than when these terms I think the 20th century when these terms really kind of crystallized I guess um, um, but uh, I'd be interested in, 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 in I don't know if you've if you've uh, written about it or read about it uh, I'd be interested in reading more about uh, the genders the gender politics of uh, of language changes thanks for a great talk Payam. Um I just had a question because you started at the beginning with your books and you made a kind of a, a quite a poignant point about the books. Um, and then we kind of end up on the image of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered if you, if there, if you made within in your practice, you made any distinction between the kind of publication of those books as works or objects that somehow fit back into the kind of research and the library from kind of where they came in a way. And then this, having to deal with the exhibition format in kind of big museums, whether there's any. Yeah, it's, it's actually something that we're thinking about a lot at the moment um, because, uh, so this is our kind of 10th anniversary and, and, and these things don't mean anything really for anybody else except for ourselves. We start to think, we start to question, sort of take stock of things you've been doing. And t for the first three or four years of our practice, we only did printed material. So you had to, to engage with our work, you had to read something on a two-dimensional piece of paper. And it, that change in charge in 2011, so for the past five years, that proliferated into more traditional forms of art, but art that museums commission by collectors, et cetera, so sculptures, installations, even these lectures like today. Um, and what we realized was that, so all these different, pr all these installations and sculptures, in fact, it's for us, the book is at the center of the practice. So it's a, it's a kind of reversal of the hierarchy normally you find in art where the book is the afterthought. The catalog is a kind of, essentially a catalog is a marketing tool, right? It's the exhibition's up and down. Somebody got to see it, others didn't, but it allows you to kind of communicate about that exhibition further. Um, and for us, the book isn't that, of course, that's why I was I emphasized that it. it's actually all those other things that are more traditional forms of art, they're actually a premise to bring people back to the book, right? So the, the space, you know, if you notice, there's a lot of reading spaces or spaces you can occupy, where there was the MoMA or this nose. Um, but what we've noticed is that since we've started to do other media, the book has been uh, progressively eclipsed by those media. So as soon as you give people the chance not to read, they will not read. <laughs> right? Essentially, it's kind of the depressing conclusion that we came to. And now we're thinking, right now, is we have to kind of reactivate or re, kind of reactivate the book at the center of our practice? How can we make the book again the center of the practice without abandoning those other media? Um, and uh, we haven't figured it out yet, to be honest. Um, but it's something we're definitely thinking about. And it's, it's, uh, it's also, it's not just the public, but in some sense, I mean, we're super grateful for public institutions and infrastructure, especially in Europe, where sort of government-funded arts institutions because that's what we that's how we survived for the and that's how we still survive most of our commissions the overwhelming number of our commissions are from the public sector but the problem is is that those that public sector let's say is also uh, accountable more and more like in education so they want bang for the buck right so as our ironically as our commissions have grown in size and budget and scope it's become more difficult for us to do the research in the books that we wanted, that we were doing originally when our budgets were 200, 300 euros. Now, because they don't want to give you 20 grand to go do a book, right? They want, to, they want, they want something that sort of brings in people and they can occupy and there's, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a material trace of it in some sense. So it's a, it's, it's a challenge. And, and, um, and we, I think we're moving more and more into audio works to try to help immaterialize that also. Um, I think you have to also, when you're dealing with language so much, you can't just have language as a, as a printed, as a visible, visual language. It has to be somewhere performed. So we're doing, we're thinking about audiobooks at the moment. 
audiobooks are an interesting format, if you think about it. I mean, I grew up in the States where in the 70s and 80s, audiobooks were really like, I mean, I was a kind of wannabe intellectual, so I looked down upon them. You know, like no serious book would be an audiobook in the 80s. In the English-speaking world, I don't think so. In Poland, and I don't know how it was in Russia, but in Poland, during communism, actually very serious books were, uh, were always an audiobooks. So from the very beginning, you had like Gombrowicz, Nabokov translated into, or done into audiobooks. Uh, and in the, state, and in, in the English language, I think it's only since the kind of arrival of podcasts and portable that that's become the case. I think the past decade, really, that you have like James Joyce now in audiobook format. And, um, but what I think is interesting about the audiobook is it's, it's a distracted form of listening, right? So you never put on an audiobook and sit down and listen. Right? You do an audiobook when you're driving, or when you're chopping vegetables. And that, I think, is quite indicative of our time in a sense, like it's, it's only through when you're, it's, it's a kind of generous form of listening. It doesn't require your total attention. It's not totalizing like reading is. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a bibliophile, but I understand that reading is really, you can't do anything else but read when you're reading. And somehow that sadly feels more and more out of place in our study, that kind of total uh, attention. What's your next project? Um, the next project yeah. is actually called Pankshan, or Hanfren, and it's going to be a, a anthropomorphic piece of horseradish. <laughs> it tells the story of different Orientalisms. Um, because one of the things we're looking at is that, um, how Russian Orientalism, Polish Orientalism, German Orientalism all offer an interesting counterpoint to a kind of Saidi Orientalism. Because unlike the English and the French, the Russians didn't go far away to conquer people. They went across the border to people who had previously conquered them. So it would be as if the English went and took over India like two, three centuries after the Indians had actually conquered England. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, we'll see how this piece of horseradish comes to life. Because horseradish in Russian and, and Polish also means to bullshit. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a verb you use. This to horseradish means to bullshit. In Polish, and it also is a, is a it's a kind of um, it's a slang for penis in Russian, horseradish. It's a kind of quintessentially Eurasian root, the horseradish. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about your use of media and the internet, particularly for uh, not promoting, but what's the word? Spreading out your ideas. Because I, I just looked at your website and I noticed all these books, which are. You know, I kind of have a craft about them. They're weighty to tomes or something. They're also available as a PDF. Uh, and obviously that's playing in with your use of different languages and cross-continent uh, connections. So it's not really a question. I just wondered if that might be something you could speak about slightly more in depth. Um, I mean, the internet is very important. Uh, it's, a kind of, it's become its own... Almost, it's, I don't know how you call it. There's, it's very important in artistic practice today as well. I, I don't, and when I think about the internet in, as an artistic medium, I feel very old, to be honest, because um, I don't actually think about the internet very often. I know that's, it's, uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a disclaimer, it's just it's a confession. Uh, I'm of a generation which is not native to the internet, so maybe that's why. I, I, uh, but the, to answer your question concretely about like PDFs, because we, because, uh, well, it, it kind of goes to the actual unhealthiness of the publishing industry and the art publishing industry. As you might know or not know, um, you never, there, you, whenever you publish a book, you have to essentially find the financing for it yourself, right? Which is, publishers are unfortunately no longer publishers, they're just distributors, and they just distribute your book. I mean, most out of all the books we published, only one publisher has ever given us editorial feedback. The other publishers have literally just waited till you bring the content, you bring the money from an institution or elsewhere, and they just spread, they make sure the book is in the bookshops. Um, and so we make it available as PDFs because, uh, and it's, that's caused an issue for publishers. They say like, well, can you wait a couple months while we sell the book? And we say, well, no, since you didn't uh, lift a finger or finance a penny, no, <laughs> it's free, and it's, it's just, uh, I mean, a lot of our, this idea of generosity and hospitality is very important for us, um, not only 
conceptually, but also just uh, it says a lot about our culture. If you think about the fact that our spaces of our, our spaces of like venues, art venues are extremely uncomfortable places to be. Like the lighting is horribly like overhead, like uh, very harsh clinical lighting, um, and there's nowhere to sit unless it's a cafe or books or like or a masterpiece. So there's always a bench in front of. Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, but there's nowhere else a bench to sit. And we came to art relatively late. At age 30, we had careers and other things before. So it, was, it surprised us because maybe we idealized the cultural kind of professions and thought that, you know, there's, it's, I understand that the Ministry of Defense is not a place you want to hang out. <laughs> but if like museums that are publicly funded are not places that are very accommodating, then uh, I think that's one of the kind of very uh, intuitive reasons why we creating spaces to occupy as well, because it was first for ourselves. We were just waiting around so much during install, and we realized that we have to spend so much time in these spaces that are not very welcoming otherwise, that we have to be able to be in the space. And actually, if you want to have any kind of relationship to work that's not just passing or fleeting, then it would help to give people a space to occupy and to actually think and consider the work. Um, but uh, I think, I mean, one of the things that I guess I could, I mean, it'll, it'll only come off as more cranky kind of, but about the internet is that people can assume, you know, nowadays research-based artists there are everywhere. And, uh, and it's, we're very old fashioned in the sense that we actually, um, we, instead of having like an art assist, an assistant that helps with production, I have somebody who's doing almost full-time just research in a library and gathering material like JSTOR articles, scholars, like some of whom are here today, like their work and then they feed it to us and we read it. And uh, so we don't, uh, there's this, this idea that you can find everything on the internet is also quite flawed, especially in our region. I mean, you, you can't find a lot of books that we read um, on the internet uh, or in libraries and the, uh, the catalog. Sometimes you have to actually travel. So we do two types of research. One is a bibliographic kind of academic research. And then what you might, I mean, again, Scholars would, would laugh at me like I laugh at others, sort of saying it's not field research because we only spend a couple of weeks in that field. But we do go to the places that we're studying and, and, and gather material after we've done a certain amount of preliminary uh, bibliographic research. But yeah, all of our books are available uh, as PDFs for sure. I mean, I, sometimes I regret that we don't think about it more because I think that I don't know how easy it is to read PDFs. I mean, I, I, re I hate reading PDFs on my tablets. I think, but the kind of technology or the effort it requires to make an ebook, I haven't been uh, convinced of it yet to, to, to do so, really. We're going to work with Triple Canopy maybe in, the, in a, uh, this year, which is a really interesting kind of online journal. Um, they've been one of the most pioneer, uh, kind of important pioneers in thinking about content, written word, and, and sort of publications on the internet. Um, but I don't know what, that, what shape that'll take. And we'll really look to them in the same way that we work with craftsmen producing our work. We'll really look to them because they're specialists of that, of the technology to kind of help us out. I have a question about the audio book, actually, because, I mean, that, I mean, you mentioning that actually got me into thinking that because listening to an audio book is a very particular kind of listening because it's one single voice in a very quiet environment. It's basically in, you know, recorded in the studio which is an entirely different kind of listening than, for instance, listening to a cassette rec you know, made from live preaching in a mosque mm -hmm. with all the noises, all the, all the responses from, from the people. So in that sense, the kind of listening to audiobook, to me, just sounds quite bourgeois. It's a particular kind of, you know, <laughs> you're chopping vegetables, right? You're chopping vegetables and listening to an audiobook. In that, very bourgeois. <laughs> that silent, kind of calming environment. But at the same time, I'm thinking about, because you're working with transliteration with languages, and if you do have an audiobook, would it be possible to make it following the format of something like polyphony in music, that you have different languages? But that particular scene you played from the Pulp Fiction, actually, the voice, I mean, the, uh, the Polish voice is much louder than the original voice, right? So it's more like a voice over rather than, mm -hmm. you know, parallel existence of different voices. But in polyphony, it might be a little bit different. That this voice, the intensity of these different voices might stay at the same level. So people can, literally speaking, people can pick up these different voices like they're listening to a polyphonic song. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's like 
when you're reading the same script, for instance, classical Chinese, if you have a Japanese scholar who can read classical Chinese, but you let him intone or you know, pronounce the script, that would be an entirely different sound. So you can maybe you can do similar kind of thing, and rather than speaking, you make it into listening. That you listen to a polyphonic text through the audio, and you can pick up, I mean, people speaking different languages can pick up different voices and different languages, while actually they're all listening to the polyphonic audio book. That might be an interesting kind of intervention, I don't know, just an idea. Um, it's, a, it's a very good point because this, um, first, the, first of all, the, divi the difference between audiobook, as soon as you introduce other voices or other sounds, we've been thinking about this also, is that what, what is the difference between audiobook and um, a radio play, for example, right? That becomes, I mean, it's equally bourgeois, but, <laughs> but there's, it's acting out parts. In audiobooks, you never have uh, people act out parts. You don't have another voice come in. You don't have background noise, as you mentioned. Um, this, uh, this question of polyphony is actually, so our most recent audio work, which is, um, I can find it here, is, um, is called Lector. And it essentially is a six-channel six um, six uh, text that has all the different voices. So each row of speakers is a different uh, language. One, one row, another row, and, uh, and it has this polyphony. So it's actually voice over. It's an Uyghur text. Um, I'll play it for you, actually. So, and it, each, so it basically traces the venues of the exhibition. So by the end, right now, it's in Houston. And it's, uh, it started out Uyghur, then, then German, Polish, so everywhere, Zurich, Bialystok. And, um, and uh, it ends with uh, Spanish here. And I can uh, play it for you. Um, here, maybe. This is the, the, the Dutch one. And it's, it, it, they speak over each other in these, Afri in these kind of uh, verses. So um, it was, uh, and this is sort of uh, the different iterations of it. It was always sort of uh, in these rahle like speakers, so the kind of book stand. Uh, um, and, um, and yeah, you again, like this voiceover translation of the film, people actually, they, they managed this is why I didn't manage in 96 to listen to understand the Russian, because I didn't speak Russian then. And now, of course, I only hear the Russian. I don't hear the Italian, because I don't understand Italian. So you, you zone in on, on what you hear. Um, yeah. You talk about the, necess like the generosity and hospitality in your work. And I'm curious as, as to where English finds its place into that. I mean, as, as just kind of the basic Westerner, I primarily sp only speak English and, and a rudimentary of, of a couple others, but not enough for uh, an understanding level. So when I hear these other languages, which your work is kind of fundamentally based on these, these different languages, I, I, I hear them for the sound piece you just played in, in mm. abstractly, right? There's nothing for me to, to take from it other than the sounds itself, but yet English kind of finds itself as this third party almost when you're often working with two different, you know, uh, Arabic and, and, and Russian, and then English kind of comes in as that third party, the funnel, to almost explain it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm curious as, as to like that relationship, is, is that the generosity and the hospitality? <laughs> is you explaining it to people like me that just don't know any other languages, you know? <laughs> it's, um, you, you, uh, you put your finger on it actually more ways than one. Actually, so first of all, the, the, the last three iterations of this sound piece were in uh, Edinburgh, Brisbane, in Australia, and in Houston, all of which, all of these places where English is the first language. And we chose not to do English. We chose the second language. Or, so in Edinburgh, we did Scott Gaelic. And uh, in Australia, Australia, we did an Aboriginal language. And, and in Houston, Spanish. Um, the reason why it wasn't in, in, I hope it doesn't come across as kind of asshole-ish. 
Um, no. But the reason why actually was because um, in some ways, yes, the work, all of the work is in some sense at a kind of an attempt to resist the hegemony of English as a kind of transactional language. And not that we're against English in any way, but actually um, the relationship you have with the work, I'm somebody who is a very, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm a, I'm a linguist, I'm a, write, a word person, I'm not a visual person. So if I'm able to understand, we didn't want people to come in and understand the text. Because then your relationship with the work becomes very different. Uh, and actually, I don't understand any of those languages. I mean, all this, for me, it was even a challenge because I, I speak four languages, but none of the six, unfortunately, no venue where I spoke a language invited us to a show. So I don't speak German, I don't speak Polish, I don't speak uh, Uyghur or Turkish or Spanish. I mean, I can approximate because of other languages, but the rela we really wanted to have, a, again, a non-rational, a non-hermeneutic understanding. And this is something that uh, it goes, uh, like I said, I'm actually the first uh, victim of that, in a sense, because I'm a totally hermeneutically minded person. I want to understand everything. Like when I go to art, most exhibits and I read artist statements, I don't understand. And it bothers me, like fundamentally bothers me that in the profession that I'm working, I don't understand what people are talking about. And I think, well, if I don't understand, then how about my uncle, who's like an engineer, Right? How is he going? Maybe he understands more actually because he's not in that profession. But uh, um, yeah, it's an attempt to uh, to you know even language like uh, the the huh, It's an attempt to look at language as a not as a kind of a, a practice which is either metaphysical, sacred, uh, affective, sexual, but not the idea of language as I have something to say to you, and I say it to you, and you have something to say back to me. You know, like something sort of trying to give language a bit more credit than we often do give it, I guess. I mean, which is, in some ways, goes to our whole question of, we get the question often, why do you do art? Why not just, why not just develop this stuff in other, in, in, a, in an article? Why not write for, why not be a journalist? And, you know, and it's a very good question, but I think part of it is that Rosie asked about the relationship of books. You know, um, for us, the books and the lecture performances, in some sense, articulate ideas. Right? But the art has to disarticulate those ideas. Meaning that if art articulates, then it's not really interesting. And the only interesting work for us, our own work or other people's work, is when, and disarticulate doesn't mean it doesn't articulate. It doesn't mean it's silent. It means like, you know when you're like trying to trace the path of somebody, like say in water or like with dogs, and somebody muddles the water and you lose the trace. In some sense, the artwork has to scramble that articulation for ourselves as well as for the audience, you know? So I was wondering if you could, um, I don't know if I have a question, but I w was wondering if you could explain a little bit, like there's this uh, site specificity in the work, but it's mainly uh, language, uh, specific in language in a way. And I was wondering, the, the visual aesthetic is really specific as well. I was wondering if you could talk about where that comes from. Mm -hmm. And if it changes as well? Um, so because we're a collective and, and, and because we're more than one, there's, always, there's this idea of embracing your antithesis is also in the, the working process is that uh, the person I work with and the people I work with are often completely different to me. So, um, and they're more visually inclined, but also means a different way of thinking. Uh, how we get to the visuals that kind of we get to, we're both involved. We edit each other. So I edit this person's writing. I mean, she edits my writing. I edit her, our, sort of her, her visualizations, let's say. And also, we work with craftspeople often. And that's as a, there's a, it's a deliberate choice to work with craftspeople. Originally, it was a budget reason, is that you know, our, uh, nowadays, a lot of artists make their work with companies that produce artwork, right? And, uh, and we couldn't afford that in the beginning, to be honest. Uh, and, we, and we ended up realizing that a lot of times these people who create works for many artists, in Berlin there's at least five companies that just do work for, for art. They produce work for artists. And so they're working with a lot of different artists. And so there's a kind of danger that, that it becomes, things start to look similar, right? Um, what's interesting about working with craftsmen is that craft is quite radical because it, for two reasons. One is that, or for many reasons, I'm sure, but one of the reasons is that craft decouples the idea of innovation from the individual. Right? In the craft tradition, it's not about, innovation is not about you, which art is totally about you, the individual. 
where you studied, how old are you, what are you trying to say, and craft is not about that. And, uh, and that's what we like about it, is that there's a, there's, a delib there's a kind of necessary loss of control in the sense that also often when you go to craft traditions, there's a, there's a tension between craft and art, fine art, right? And this tension, you feel it when you work with craftsmen because uh, these are, there's a, in craft also, innovation is, is not through rupture. So in our Western art history, we always think of like, you know, the Dadas came and they were against the Impressionists. And then after the Dadas, the Surrealists were against the Dadas. This idea that you're confrontational, you're breaking at all times, a bunch of ruptures. Avant-garde is a series of ruptures. And in crafts, it's actually you're innovating through, the, through continuity and not through rupture. So it's actually, what we do is when we meet, when we meet with a glass blower or a Suzanne maker, a embroiderer, we don't go there sort of like young whippersnappers and sort of like, this is what we want. <laughs> you know, you actually, it's, a, it's a question of respect. These are elders, and you have to inscribe yourself in their tradition and not them working for you. So it, it, kind of, it, it, it presents an interesting discipline and hierarchy, really, uh, versus the hierarchy that you would normally imagine with a kind of commissioning. We commission somebody. You know? In fact, in some ways, they're teaching us. We're not teach, or we're, you know, they're, they're very much the elder, in that sense, or the wiser one. Um, well, how our visuals work, though, it's, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I mean, there's, we get accused of all kinds of things, like it's too poppy, it's too colorful, it's too orientalizing. Um, and um, I think there's, uh, there, there, there is one thing which is very, when you're dealing with subject matter like ours, I think there's a definite awareness that we don't believe, again, in the sense of like, political art has to be confrontational. We don't believe in speaking at our audience. And a lot of political art in the 70s, let's say, it's a different time, but the art was speaking at you. If you think about like the Gorilla Girls, and it's incredible work, even, you know, um, uh, let's, uh, uh, or, I mean, but yeah, Hakka is, 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 is quite sophisticated in the sense of it still doesn't, it doesn't speak at you. You don't feel like you're being lectured. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the famous uh, sort of feminist art of the of the, the poster, the woman who makes a poster of a type, Barbara Krugner. For me, this is like a it, it it it's a different era, and it's sort of speaking at you. And I think it's very important that you speak with your audience. Um, and so I guess there's an attempt to uh, again bring those two things that you normally don't put together. Is how can you bring difficult political subject matter? How can you deliver critique in a in a humorous or in a joyous way? Uh, because it's really easy to take something down, critique it. It's very difficult to commemorate and critique at the same time. So I often uh, talk about it like it's difficult to elevate something and to stab it in the back at the same time. But that's really what the, the, that's the challenge is to el is to really sort of edify and bring down at the same time. That's this kind of uh, this uh, this push in the pool. That was that was a really interesting. Uh, lecture, thank you. Um, I got a question about a time. You mentioned, you talked about time at the very beginning, and um, you said something very interesting about the kind of strategy where you put past in um, kind of ahead of you, and you kind of, you and the future is behind. And um, yeah, I just wondered whether you could expand a little bit on that and uh, yeah in relation to the work or, or philosophy in, in relation to the ideas that you mm. um, or you know philosoph philosophy that you that you mentioned like Benjamin for example um, I mean since we look I mean a lot of our work obviously is dealing with history in some sense and I think that uh, the, qu the question again is how do you activate that history to make it relevant to different audiences, especially the further you go from our region. I mean, the, re the reason why our region has become so-called remote or obscure is really its exception, not the rule. It's really only the 20th century that our region, let's say, between these former Berlin Wall and the Great Wall of China became remote. Because today, people probably know more about what's happening, like, they know more about what happens in Star Wars than in, like, Kazakhstan, or, like, the language of Klingon than they know about Kazakh. And I think that's actually just an exception, because, uh, I think for the most part of the last two millennia, the region was at the center of history in some sense, right? Whether it was the Silk Road or whether it was 
the great game between the English and the Russians, or whether it was the golden age of Islam in the kind of 10th, 13th centuries. Um, so so uh, we, op we often think about how do we make that work immediate. That's, that, uh, that's, you know, and the more obscure, we're kind of, we're drawn by more and more obscure subject matters. I mean, the, the audio piece I, I shown, this, like, this, this exhibition which is traveling around, uh, it's called Mirrors for Princes. And it's basically looking at a medieval form of advice literature for future kings. Uh, so Machiavelli is the most famous. In German, it's called Fürstenspiegel. So it was like, basically it was the first type of political science. And it was in the 10th and the 13th centuries. And uh, it was the first time that people put political science, statecraft, on the same level as religious writing. So in the medieval, until like the 10th, the 13th centuries, most of the writing was <coughs> religious jurisprudence, theology. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's, uh, we have to kind of, we're, we're obviously consumed by that question of how to make these, these our areas of interest share them. And that's why it goes back to the book club in some senses. In a book club, there's no hierarchy. I'm not even, com I'm com uncomfortable with the term pedagogical, because there's a pedagogical turn in art the past decade, let's say. And I think it's dangerous because, for us, because we're not pedagogues. I mean, pedagogues assume that you know, I know, and you don't. But actually, all the subjects that we're looking at are things that we don't know. So we're actually devoting ourselves to those things we don't understand. If it was about things that I'd studied, then I would be talking to you only about like Beckett and, uh, and like early 20th century like modernists, which most of you know. So there's no point. And that's why we often don't even use, we often don't like to use the names of scholars and theorists that you've all read. I mean, Benjamin is an exception here. But you know, we don't, uh, we don't talk about Rancière and Agamben because we've all read that. You know, you guys have read it, we've read it, Deleuze, we've all read it. Let's talk about things we haven't read, right? And I'm interested in actually hearing about things that you haven't read or I haven't read, and those things I don't understand, whether it's even faith and religiosity or things that, you know, I was raised a secular person for various historical reasons, and, uh, and you know, dealing with religiosity is something which is a difficult thing, was a difficult thing for me, and it's, actually, and it's, it's only through dealing with those things we don't understand those, and those kind of seemingly antithetical, antithetical things that we learn something. Because if we only deal with things we do understand, it gets quite insular boring. and boring, yeah. So maybe we'll start painting one day <laughs> and make some money, actually. <laughs> Well, I think that's it. So thank you, thank thanks you again for coming, and I look forward to speaking to you tomorrow.